All right. So I'm just going to give a little um, overview of BNRC. Um, and first, I'd like to start the program with a land acknowledgement. Um, so it is with gratitude and humility that we acknowledge that we are learning, speaking, and gathering on the ancestral homelands of the Mohican people. Despite tremendous hardship in being forced from here today, their community resides in Wisconsin and is known as the Stockbridge Muncie community. We pay honor and respect to their ancestors, both past and present, and as we commit to building a more inclusive and equitable space for all. Um, so for those who are new to BNRC, um, we are a regional land trust actively working throughout Berkshire County on land conservation, land stewardship, and community engagement. BNRC conserves land to protect water resources and wildlife habitat for climate resilience and also to connect people to the natural world. Um, you may be aware, but Berkshire County actually serves as an important connection um, of a wildlife corridor that extends from the Hudson Highlands to the Green Mountains. And corridors like this are critical for the maintenance of ecological processes, including allowing for the movement of animals and the continuation of sustainable populations. Um, BNRC is increasing involvement in initiatives that meaningfully connect people of all ages to bird conservation um, through community science. Um, these programs are through Cornell's lab and are called Nest Watch and Celebrate Urban Bird Programs. If you'd like to learn more, feel free to be in touch. Our speaker tonight will um, relay the importance of habitat pr protection and scientific research by sharing current projects of the Berkshire Bird Observatory, which include migration monitoring and bird banding, taconic mountain bird surveys, and kestrel nest boxes. Given that there's been nearly 30% reduction in North American bird populations since 1970, research like this has never been so important. So with that, I'm gonna pass it over to uh, my coworker, Rich. Hello everyone, good to see you here this afternoon. My name is Rich Montone. I'm the director of fundraising at BNRC. So I am just here to briefly remind all of us that BNRC is donor supported. Donors are what make BNRC go. All of the land conservation, the wildlife and habitat protection, the climate resiliency, the preservation of local farms, and the free access to the Berkshire outdoors that BNRC provides for everybody is made possible by donors. I'll put a donation link in the chat in case you would like to donate, but that's not required for this program. This program and all of BNRC's programs are um, because of and thanks to donors though. And I do see many donors here already. So thank you for your support. Thank you, Rich. And hello everyone. As Mariah said, I'm Charlotte and I'm BNRC's volunteer and outreach assistant. Um, I'm just going to give a little background on our star of this afternoon's program, Ben Nickley. Ben is a lifelong nature lover with a passion for bird research. His work has taken him to some of the finest natural areas in North America, but of all the ecosystems he's worked in, he likes none better than our beloved Eastern deciduous forest and feels truly privileged to have landed in the Berkshires. He is a federally and state licensed bird bander with a master's in biology and lots of experience doing the research he loves. All right, I'll pass it over to you, Ben. And thanks for being here. Yes, thank you. I'm so glad to be here and to talk about Berkshire Bird Observatory with all of you. Thank you for the introduction, Charlotte, and thank you, Mariah, for inviting me to give this talk. So I will just share my screen here. Can you all see it? The sort of, yeah. Yes, okay, great. So let's see, I haven't done a Zoom talk in like a while. If I press this button, then it goes to my name, right? That works, okay, great. So yes, so I'm Ben Nickley. Um, I'm the director of Berkshire Bird Observatory, which is supported by Green Berkshires, a local conservation nonprofit that's dedicated to advocacy, environmental ad advocacy, and also, a sort of biodiversity inventory and monitoring project in the South Taconic, the South Taconic. So I would say they, they focus on the South, we focus on the South Taconic Massif. So there's our little logo. So I'm, before I get into all of Berkshire bird stuff, I just want to give a brief introduction, you know, and tell you all a little bit about 
me. So I was born in Massachusetts, which I'm proud of. <laughs> I was born in Plymouth, Massachusetts, which was like, you know, where the Mayflower thing landed and the pilgrims and that kind of thing, 1620. I think that was maybe one of the first colonies in the this the you know, new world kind of thing. Um, so that's great, but I didn't stay there very long. Unfortunately, my parents decided to move to the Midwest, God knows why. So they moved to Ohio, Michigan, Minnesota, that kind of thing. And we bounced around in the Midwest for most of my upbringing, sadly. Um, so yeah, so I went to Ohio State University for my undergrad, which was in evolution and ecology. Ohio State is like a huge research institution. It's like a city within the city of Columbus, an academic city, which is actually pretty cool. Um, so yeah, I kind of cut my teeth there. Um, oh, wait a second, I'm seeing people. Okay, so that, I'm, I'm gonna point out some buildings that were important in my development. So this one here is the Science and Engineering Library, which was open 24 seven. And since I'm a procrastinator sometimes when I have to do things I don't want to do, I spent a lot of late nights in the Science and Engineering Library. So yeah, that was an important one. This is the Philosophy Building, uh, which was important for a different reason. Um, some of my philosophy classes were the most enjoyable and thought provoking classes of my entire time at Ohio State and they prompted me to pursue a philosophy minor. Um, so yeah, I, I, I really loved that about Ohio State really digging deep into, you know, Kant, Mill, whatever. Um, so yeah, this building is Moral Tower, my brother, uh, he, he had a dorm in there and Will, he's uh, now a design professor at Ohio State and he did our logo. So it's great to have, you know, siblings with talent and stuff like that. Um, okay, so yes, this is Aronoff Lab. Um, I kind of did my first little research projects in Aronoff on behavior, behavioral ecology of brush-legged wolf spiders, sexual selection type research, which was fascinating to me. And it encouraged me to get into more research that involves like animal communication and you know behavior and a lot of the research at Ohio State that was focused on behavior also focused on songbirds because songbirds have very complex communication systems both visual and vocal and there were some really you know high level faculty people at Ohio State at that time that were working on birds so because of that I bit the bullet and decided to take an ornithology class, which required me to get up at what, like 7.30 in the morning. Um, so reluctantly, I'm like, okay, I gotta take ornithology. And our first ornithology lab we had outside, which that was great. I'm used to these labs, you know, chemistry, whatever, physics, all that inside. No, we did it right there outside on the salt, South Oval. And my TA pointed out this, bird, a ruby crown kinglet, which was the first, it, I wouldn't say it's the first bird I'd ever seen. Sure, I'd probably seen robins and like goldfinch before, but it was the first wild bird that I really noticed for the first time. And it was just like totally magic. And from that point on, my life changed. Like this, this little ruby crown kinglet had a pivotal point in my life. Um, and yeah, so it was just like birds. I was just in deep after that. Um, okay, so this is a little out of order, but yes, my wolf spider stuff led to a little paper on that, which was cool. I'm a scientist now, that's great. Um, <clears throat> let's see. Yes, okay, so here's another building to point out. This is the geology building. I did some work. I got involved with the bird work, of course, because I'm all about birds now. And I got in with uh, the Bohr Lab of Bioacoustics at Ohio State and did some indoor lab stuff for them in the basement of the Orton Hall, the geology building there. And we, were look and we were looking at um, trying to assign white crown sparrows to their source populations based on the chemical composition of their feathers. So in order to do that, I had to follow all these lab procedures and cut up feathers with diamond scissors, which was pretty cool, and then run them through an ICP mass spectrometer, which is a very kind of special piece of equipment. I think there's only like two in the Eastern United States and run them through there and do all this machine does all this chemistry stuff or whatever. And we 
we're able to kind of like figure out where birds came from based on the chemical signatures in their feathers. And then we compare that to the kinds of songs they were singing, um, which is really interesting because these birds, they have their own culture. Their song structure varies based on where they were born and which singers they heard uh, singing as they were growing up and developing. So it was a really fascinating study. I was glad to be part of it. Okay, I guess it's not working. And it led to another paper, which is great. I got two papers for my undergrad, I'm doing good. Um, so after undergrad, I stayed on at the Bohr Lab of Bioacoustics and it was my first real job. Great, I'm a research associate. But for me, that was like all computer stuff all the time indoors and that is not my thing at all. So I found out that there's, after the project ended, right? I finished the project, but I found out there's a job board that's just like, you know, for bird jobs and outdoor stuff. So immediately I found a job outside with these wonderful birds, uh, tree swallows. And it was a big nest box monitoring project in Eastern Tennessee. Um, and we were looking at how a big uh, fly ash spill in 2008 impacted wild bird populations, like an ecotoxicology study. And I got out in the field and, you know, I was on, you know, on the water or next to the water every day, working with wild birds, even catching them and banding them and everything. It was just incredible. And even though they worked us 70 hours a week, Virginia Tech University, and even though they only paid us for 40 hours a week, Virginia Tech, I still loved it and didn't matter. I was all about it. And so yeah, field jobs. It opened up a whole world for me, like finding out that I could gain field research skills by traveling around North America to some of the most beautiful places and taking these tempor temporary seasonal jobs. And so that's what I did. I did this for many years. Here are some of the places that I was a permanent, or sorry, not permanent, temporary, but full-time overtime, honestly, field biologist. And there are other places that I worked as like a volunteer or on a part-time basis. And I haven't included those in this map, but this just gives you an idea of kind of where I bounced around um, after undergrad. So yes, I just wanna give you a brief sort of glimpse into the life of a field biologist, because it is a weird one. I mean, it's, and it's fun. So basically it's winter, right? And we're field biologists, so we hibernate in the winter because there's very little work. You're lucky if you can get a job. And so then it's late winter, it's early spring, it's time to wake up, you're somewhere you've applied for a job at somewhere else. This picture that I'm showing you is Ohio, one of the better places of Ohio. It is indeed late winter. And it's time for me to go to my job that I took out in California, leading Point Blue Conservation Sciences uh, bird, bird crew in the Sierra. So I need to travel cheap because I'm poor, because I'm a field biologist and I study birds and no one pays you to study birds. So I only stay at the finest hotels, but I don't pay anything for them because they're in the forest and I have my tent. Here's a nice little place in, I think this is Daniel Boone National Forest, Kentucky. Not a bad place to stay, honestly. Make my way out west. It's snowing in New Mexico, but that's okay. My little tent can handle that. The food's not free in New Mexico, but I had to treat myself because, you know, their chilies and stuff, it's delicious. I make it to the Red Rocks of Arizona, it's beautiful. My mini is holding up, that's great. It made it to the next hotel. And look at the, my fellow guests, Acorn Woodpecker. So you know this is a very classy place if they're also staying there. I finally make it out to California. There's snow on the ground, even though it's late May, which is unusual for me, I'm not used to that. Like big, real mountains kind of stuff. Time to start work. First day on the job, we go out to the banding station and the boss's boss thinks it's a good idea to wear rubber boots over his waders and then he needs us to help him take them off, which was actually a really funny moment. Western birds, beautiful, right? It's a privilege to catch Western birds. This is a Western tanager. Part of my job for Point Blue was catching and banding birds as part of their Sierra Meadow monitoring project and also their MAPS sort of summer banding project. So I got to lead that aspect of the job, but most of the job was hiking around in the back country in very beautiful areas, counting birds off the map because they wanted to document the distribution of breeding birds in the Northern Sierras in many of the national forests uh, that kind of 
are contiguous up there in the South Cas Cascades in Northern Sierra. So I was in charge of leading the crews out there, doing this backcountry work. It was usually camping like three or four days in remote areas by myself with my tent and my clipboard and running around, but very beautiful and sometimes very challenging. Field work isn't all fun. Um, you're gonna see a lot of really pretty pictures in this presentation, but I'd like to remind you that field work can be very tough sometimes. This is a picture of the Moonlight Fire, which was a mega fire in California. I think it was 2010 maybe when that all happened. And I had to sample this sort of post burn habitat for birds and our points are all off trail. Like there are no trails out there. So I was walking hundreds and hundreds of meters through this basically thicket of manzanita and white thorn and tobacco bush, which is almost impenetrable and it's all over my head and there's bears all over the place too that are just hanging out in there and eating the berries and stuff and so yeah that was pretty challenging but hey sierra's beautiful they have mountain meadows that's great but each mountain meadow comes with about a million mosquitoes and the lava flows and rock formations of the upper modoc also very beautiful but there's rattlesnakes all over that but there's snow peaks in summer, so can't really complain. And I get to ban birds and I get to share my passion for birds with kids, which is great. These kids loved it. So it was great. It was a good summer. It was a good field job. Now it's on to the next thing. So that's the life of a field biologist. You bounce around, you have some trials, you see some pretty places, you meet some cool people and it just continues. So I was doing that for a while, but you can't do that indefinitely. And if you're serious about science and you wanna do research, you do have to go back to grad school. So I did. I went to VCU, which is in Richmond, Virginia. And VCU is a big state school. It's known mostly for their fine arts programs. They're actually very good. I think they're like one or two in the country for fine arts, which is crazy because it's a state school. But as an R1 research institution, they're also, they do sciencey stuff. I went there to study redheaded woodpeckers, their full annual cycle ecology. And this is just like the cover page of my thesis. I wanted to know everything about these birds. They are absolutely fascinating. And my first field season studying them was in the winter in Virginia on a military base. And I started out just spending all the time I could in the field. And the initial sort of study since the winter was like, you know, what do I do? Like these birds aren't kind of on territories. So they're not easy to find. I'm like, well, you know what? No one's ever sort of found where they sleep or kind of what habitat they use in the winter, like winter roost sites. So I followed them every single night for, I don't know, two months or something in the cold and in the dark. And I found out a lot about where red and woodpeckers sleep. And that was a paper, it was a good one. I also wanted to know what they do during the breeding season. And there were several papers out that focused on their habitat use in sort of like open savanna-like habitat. And there's this idea that these birds are birds of kind of open country or savannas, you know, interspersed trees, but a lot of open space. But that's not what I was seeing at AP Hill. I was seeing that, well, in the winter, they're actually in mature sort of closed canopy forests. And in the summer, they actually use the great diversity of cover types that were available at Fort AP Hill. So I did a comparative study to see how they mixed and matched and pieced together a territory using different kinds of habitats. And that led to another paper looking at this, I don't know, sort of like, I don't know, it's like a landscape ecology kind of thing, how they're using a complex landscape mosaic to meet their needs during the breeding season. So that was another one. But I wasn't done there. Yes, it's a master's. But I wanted to know everything. And when I get into something, I get in very deep. And so I had all this other stuff and it's still on my computer and manuscripts, analyzed data and data form. I have three more chapters, but you know what? It was time to move on. So you hit the job board. And then I ended up at UW-Madison in the PhD program. But when I got there, it was COVID. It was 2020, the university was shut down, completely shut down. The town was completely shut down. It's the upper Midwest. That's what it looked like in winter. All I saw all winter was the inside of my efficiency flats and an outside landscape like that. I couldn't even dig my mini out of the snow. So I did some soul searching and I came to three important conclusions. One, 
I don't like academia. Two, PhD is a bit of a scam. And three, I don't want to live in the upper Midwest ever, ever, ever again. So I hit the job board. And then I found Green Berkshires. <laughs> so now we're, we're to the main sort of part of this talk. Green Berkshires put an advertisement out on the job board, of course, for a birder, for someone that could come here to this beautiful place in the Northeast, in the Appalachian Mountains, in my beloved Eastern deciduous forest, to count birds and to document the distribution of birds in the South to comics. So I applied, I got the job, and I moved out here. And yes, now I really want to stay out here because it's an exceptional place. So I'm going to talk a little bit about that breeding bird survey that I was initially hired to do for Berkshire Bird Observatory, which is our supporting organization. It's sort of the umbrella organization that Berkshire Bird Observatory is part of. So that initial survey was a breeding bird survey. We want to know where the birds are distributed in these mountains in the South Taconics. And so the great thing about the South Taconics, and this is mostly Mount Washington village, like the majority of these mountains are contained within the village of Mount Washington, which Mount Washington is just like the coolest village ever. Um, but the good thing about it is there's extensive trail networks that run along both the Eastern Escarpment, that's the Appalachian Trail, the AT, and the Western Escarpment, which is the South Taconic Trail. And then a bunch of like sort of connector trails that go from, you know, outside of the mountain range or even internally to the peaks. So we took advantage of this to drop a bunch of points on a map along these trails so that we could get really good coverage of all the different varieties of habitat that are in the South Taconics. So here's a map of all our points. They're spaced out at about 200 to 250 meters apart. And each of these points is what I would call a point count station. It's where you, you hike up and you sit down for a while or stand really with your binoculars and your clipboard in the summer. And you look and you listen for all the birds you can detect. And our point count surveys, at, at least this season are six minutes. So for each of these points, I go to them three times each over the course of the summer and I count birds for six minutes. The reason why we go to each point three times is because if a bird's there, it's not always singing, it's not always visible, you might not always detect it. So you have to go do repeat surveys to account for detection probability and it's important in our modeling later. But anyway, I did, so I've been all up and down these mountains and I've been on these trails so many times, I know it so well and it, it is one of my favorite places. So I, I just want to show you some of the habitat and the things that I was seeing in the field for these breeding bird surveys in the mountains. So this is a view from Jug End, um, Jug End Ridge, that is. And we'll talk about Jug End more later, the valley. But I'm looking north toward Mount Greylock, and it's a beautiful early morning sort of sunrise thing. I love being out in the early morning listening to birds on. I feel great. This is the best job ever. Here's another view, and this is on the opposite end of Jug End, which is the northeast end of the South Taconics. This is the southwest end, and I'm looking north toward Mountain Brace, and you can see a pitch pine there in, uh, sort of in the foreground. And this is a very special spot to me, and it's absolutely one of my favorite views of the entire range. And Brace Mountain is kind of cool because there's paragliders that jump off that and fly uh, with birds, and I talk to them sometimes, and I, I might want to try that. I think that would be fun. Here's, here's a site that might be familiar to many of you. This is another sort of dramatic view that you know, we have in the South Taconics. This is Bashbish Falls and Bashbish Brook. And I do have a survey point very close to the falls, but it's kind of noisy and it's hard to detect the birds because of course I detect most of them with my ears because they're in the canopy, there's leaves and stuff like that. Um, but still, beautiful. So those are some dramatic views, but here's a more typical view of the habitat of one of the many kinds of habitats that we encounter in the South Taconics. This is a sort of a hemlock um, area in either a north facing slope or a bit of a gorge. And um, habitat like this supports its own unique set of birds, which I found through my surveys. Um, Blue-headed vireos, black burning and warblers, brown creepers, they're very common in these hemlock gorges but they're not really found many other places. So this is something that we're documenting with our surveys. 
Here's another, uh, another sort of micro habitat kind of thing. This is a nice little brook. And I'm actually not sure where I got this picture from. I, I'll have to go back and look, but um, little brooks like this provide crucial habitat for Louisiana water thrush, which are pretty common. Uh, you can see them bobbing their tails and running around, picking macro invertebrates out of, uh, out of little brooks like this. So another really important habitat that supports its own suite of birds. This is a more of a bottomland sort of hardwood forest, and it also has its own birds. Uh, Yellow-throated vireo is really common in here. I, I would like to show you pictures of these birds, and I'm sure some of you are maybe waiting for that, and it'll come. But I don't have a camera. I just have a phone. So the pictures I get of birds are birds in the hand, and that is something I'm going to talk about in a little bit. So as you move up the slopes, the habitat changes. When you get sort of closer to the summits, you get really thick sort of mountain laurel thickets, rhododendron kind of stuff. And in here, the bird community is totally different. You have a lot of shrub nesting species like black-throated blue warbler, um, eastern towhee, and Canada warbler. So it's really cool that it's like you just hike up for a few hundred meters and all of a sudden you're in a totally different world. I love that about mountains. I think it's absolutely fascinating. And the blooms on these mountain laurels are just absolutely stunning. When you get to the top, it changes again. And the ridge lines of these Taconic Mountains are dominated by sort of bare oak, mountain laurel to a lesser extent, and some of them have a lot of pitch pine. There's also grasses and heath, blueberry, that kind of stuff. And this habitat supports Eastern towhees, and it supports black-throated blues, black and whites, oven birds, and importantly, it supports myrtle warblers or yellow rumped warblers. So where we are in Massachusetts and basically at our latitude, yellow rumped or myrtle warblers, they, they're not really found anywhere except for on the very tippy tops of mountains like this. So I think that's really special that we have sort of like a, a summit kind of specialist here in the South Taconics. And it's an absolutely stunning bird. You'll see pictures in a little bit. Here's, here's some of the pitch pine. This is a very special plant because it's like the birds, the myrtle warblers. It's only at the very tippy top on the peaks. And these pitch pines produce cones, which have seeds, which will attract red crossbills occasionally. And actually, during this summer, I had a red crossbill detection on jug end, on the ridgeline on jug end. And that's like a totally rare bird that is like not supposed to be here, but it was coming here because of these pines, which produce the seed, which is a resource for the bird. So the mountains are very special. They're special. They're very special to me for personal reasons, but they're special in terms of the variety and diversity of habitats they offer are amazing forest birds. Yes, the AT, this is, this is, so this is the summit of Everett. I had to get an Everett summit picture in there because this is the highest point in the South Taconics, Mount Everett, not Mount Everest. Although I have read that Mount Everett was at one time higher than Mount Everest about like 200 million years ago or something, and then erosion and stuff. And now it's just kind of like a bit of a joke when you're like, yeah, I summited Mount Everett. And then it's like, people might get confused and think that you did the ice pick kind of thing. But anyway, Mount Everett, it's cool. I, I know it from many different angles. I'm always looking for Mount Everett in the landscape. I can actually see it from my flat here in Great Barrington, which is great. So I have some data. We're not doing a data talk um, because it's been two years of point count data. This year's data is not entered yet, like because I'm doing a lot of field work. But I do have our first year summarized anyway. And all the peaks, I have summary stuff for all of the birds, where things are found. But in the future, what I want to do, what I'm going to do this winter, in fact, is do some occupancy modeling. I want to know species, what kind of habitats they associate with. I also wanna know how distribution might shift over time, how occupancy might change over time. We can focus on certain species um, and, and look a little closer, but I'm really excited about this data set that we're building. And as we accumulate more data over the years, it's really gonna make the data more interesting and more valuable in terms of like monitoring and determining trends and stuff like that. So this is a figure from my, my bonus master's work. Um, and it's just like, yeah, it's a occupancy model sort of output um, graph thing. And we're gonna do this kind of stuff with this data, data set too, as it continues to come in. So I, as I'm running about, you know, on the trails and stuff and I'm, I'm listening for birds, but you know, I love it all. I love the plants, I love the fungi, 
everything. And I encounter so many, I don't know, characters out there. This is, this is a, an American toad. And it was just like, it was like the fattest, you know, like biggest American toad that I've ever seen. And it was funny because it tried to like hop away from me as I'm walking down the path and just like barely got off the ground at all. So that was, that was a special one. I, I have some videos, I hope they play. We get Porky Barn through, which is so funny. And this one just like, yep, just right up the pitch vine. It's amazing that they just climb trees and eat leaves and stuff like that. There's also snakes out there. Um, green snakes are on the sort of the Western kind of mountains, Alander and Brace. This picture is actually of a smooth green snake, which I found in Maryland because the the one that I found up on Alander just slithered away from me too quickly and I couldn't pick it up. Otherwise I would because they're beautiful snakes. There's other snakes up there too, like this one. And you don't wanna pick that one up. So the South Taconics are, I think, I think I've heard that it's sort of the most important population of timber rattlesnakes in all of New England is there in Mount Washington Village in the South Taconics which is awesome. That is so cool because they're such beautiful and amazing and very calm and chill, peaceful animals. And so whenever I'm up in the areas where I kind of know where I've seen them and stuff, I always look out for them because I want to see them because it just makes me happy to see them. They're, they're, they're absolutely stunning animals. Okay, one last little thing about point counts. This year and last year actually was kind of unusual. So this picture is from the base of Bear Mountain, which is actually in Connecticut, just over the, the mass uh, state line. And this is, was taken in the middle of the summer. These are summer surveys, right? And you might notice I'm in mature sort of, you know, closed canopy forest, but the forest floor is just full of light. That's weird. That looks like more like spring kind of thing. And I look up, where's all the leaves? There's none. I look down. Oh, there's the leaves all chewed up and all of that. I look at the tree trunks and there's all these hairy, wormy type things there. And they're on the leaves that remain in the understory. I think this is witch hazel. They don't really like witch hazel all that much, but these are the spongy moths. And we've had a terrible invasion of spongy moths this year and last year, and they've defoliated great swaths of our forest. It's very concerning. Um, so yeah, this is, yeah, it's very concerning. We wish it didn't happen, but the data that Berkshire Bird Observatory is collecting is going to kind of document effects of these, you know, these insects, these invasive insects on our bird populations. Because I, I am really curious to know how canopy birds that depend on insects that eat leaves fare when the spongy moth has completely defoliated their forest. It's a, it's a really interesting question. And I think our data over time could show how the numbers of different species respond to this in different regions of, of the mountain. Um, so it, it's interesting scientifically, but it's also really concerning that this insect has done so much damage. I hope next year it's not as bad. I saw a lot of them dying probably from a fungal or viral thing. So maybe their population is gonna crash. They, they go on boom bust cycles. So let's just keep our fingers crossed. So the black-billed cuckoo is, eats these things. And this, this bird is one of my favorite birds of all the birds. I love black-billed cuckoo. And they are voracious predators of the spongy moth caterpillar. Even though they have spines that are toxic, the black-billed cuckoo will eat them up by the dozens and even the hundreds. And when their stomach lining gets like kind of spiked with the spiny things, they just you know regurgitate it and grow another one. So this is an amazing bird and yes, I'll talk more about them later. So that's one project that we're doing, the sort of breeding bird surveys in the mountains. And it gets me out hiking around and seeing birds that are active, you know, working, doing their thing in their native sort of natural habitat. And I absolutely love it. It's a very interesting data set. Data set and I'm, I'm excited to see what we're gonna get out of the analysis this winter and how things are gonna change. Um, in subsequent summers. So we're also doing migration monitoring. And for mi migration monitoring, we're using a slightly different technique. So we're really interested in the birds that breed 
of course, in the mountains. But we're also interested in the birds that use the mountains and the surrounding landscape as stopover habitat on their way to breeding grounds further north. So the black-billed cuckoo we just talked about, they overwinter in South America. As you can see, the blue on the map, they're just down in the neotropics for most of the year. It's a tropical bird. And when it's springtime, they start to move north and they fly over all of the Caribbean, Central America, Mexico, the Southeast, and they end up, well, they do breed in some of the Southeast. They breed in Massachusetts and they breed north of us in sort of like the Canadian Shield Forest. So some of the birds we detect during our point count surveys, but some of the birds that use the mountains as stopover habitat, where they drop down, they have a bite to eat, maybe they spend a night and then they carry on, they end up further north in Canada, for example. Here's another species, ruby crown kinglet. If you look at the map for this, it's all white in Massachusetts, but ruby crown kinglets come through Massachusetts in great numbers, great numbers. And they overwinter in the Southeast and Mexico. They jump over us in the spring. You know, they'll stop over in Massachusetts and fill up, you know, eat a bunch of insects and stuff, but then they breed in the border forest in Canada. Well, Massachusetts and our forested regions are crucial for this bird, but they're only crucial for a small window of time when they're passing through. That is during migration in both the spring and the fall. So to sample this bird, you can't go to the same point in the summer and listen and look three times a year. You have to find a way to sample them as they're moving through the region. So the method that we use for this is called mist netting. And you might be able to see a mist net here. It is here. They're, they're almost transparent. They're kind of like four badminton nets strung together. That's what it's like. And each of these sort of badminton nets, I guess we'll go with that, forms a bit of a pocket. And birds, as they're flying back and forth among low vegetation, they won't see the nets. Sometimes we don't see them and we end up in them. Well, they'll fly into a net and they'll sort of fall into one of these pockets and the pocket will sort of gently cradle the bird. And then the bird will sit there and wait until we come around to take them out. So this is a mist net. And this is at our banding station, which is at Jug End State Reservation, which is sort of nestled among the South Taconic Mountains at the very northern edge. It's the valley formed by these mountains at the northern edge. And I chose Jug End for a place to monitor migration because of the habitat. What you're looking at right here is sort of a thicket of willows and a bit of a marshy sort of cattail area. And all the vegetation is low. The insect loads are very high. There's lots of water resources here and migrants concentrate in these areas. When they're flying, they stop over, they see this, they know they can get something to eat. And so they come down out of the sky in the early morning and they're all over the place. So it's a wonderful place to sample the birds that are using the habitat in our area as migrants and as resident birds. So here's, here's a bird in a mist net. This is a rose-breasted grosbeak that has flown in. And if you look on the leg there, on the right sort of tarsus, you'll notice that there's a gleaming stainless steel bands because we've already banded this bird. We already caught it and we've recaptured it. So sometimes people ask about banding. They, they wander because they care about birds and I love that. And they ask, you know, does mist netting, you know, are you hurting the birds? Is the bird scared? Is, you know, like, is it a safe method? That kind of thing. And I, I love getting that question because it's coming from a great place. It's coming from people that care about birds like me. And I answer by saying, I'm crazy about birds. And the last thing I would ever want to do is hurt a bird. I care about birds and that's why I'm a bird researcher. And I want to understand why they're declining. I want to understand what we can do to help birds. This method has been shown to be one of the safest and most effective methods that involves capture for any vertebrate species. So misnetting is a very safe thing. Of course, how safe it is depends on the ethical standards and the skill of the people that are doing it. So at Berkshire Bird Observatory, we have highly skilled people and we have the very highest ethical standards. So yes, the birds are safe. The entire process of catching, handling, taking data from the bird, banding it and releasing it takes a matter of minutes. And it's we get all these recaptures, the birds are fine they're safe and we're collecting very important data to help their populations, to help these birds, which is our ultimate goal. So I have the permits for this. Uh, last winter, I did all the permitting stuff. I have a federal permit from the federal government. Our bands are issued by the USGS, each with a unique number. So we know birds when we catch them, oh, you're this bird with this number. 
Uh, we know if we catch a bird, if we've already caught it before, or you know what age it was when we caught it. We can also figure out over time, we keep re-catching birds year in and year out, how old they are and that kind of thing. So we have permits for all of this work. We have a license permit. Uh, that's a state permit, a federal permit. We also have a license permit from Jug End to do research at their property. And I'm very grateful to Andrew Madden for helping us to get that permit so we could do this very important work at this very special place. Jug End is, is an exceptional place to monitor migration. So speaking of Andrew Madden, there he is helping us bring the gear in in early spring to start this whole thing up. So this spring was our pilot season and we started in March and there's still snow on the ground. This is Mass Wildlife Crew uh, led by Andrew and they helped us clear these net lanes. They were using the heavy equipment. I'm so grateful to them for doing that because there's no way I could have done it all by myself with my loppers. So here's a net. We, we clear the snow, we clear some lanes and we set up and we're ready to go. Um, yeah, this is one of my favorite nets. So I'll just play this really quick. This is uh, a stream net that we have going. Oh wait, this is my banding station. Okay, well, you're gonna see my banding station anyway and my gear set up. And yes, there's our old logo. <laughs> I wanted to show you the stream net, but I grabbed the wrong one. That's okay. Um, so our first day was, what, I think it was April 4th or 5th. It was too cold before then. And this is our very first bird caught, a beautiful golden crown kinglet female. And you can see the band there. They take normal aluminum bands. The stainless steel ones are for the birds that can bite really hard. But this is our first bird, very exciting moment. I was at the banding station. Early on in the season, we're catching mostly resident species um, like black cap chickadee, which you can find year round. Cardinal, they're biters. And sometimes we give them a little stick to chew on instead of chewing on our fingers. And they take this special stainless steel bands because they can, they could crush a normal band because they, have, you know, they eat really hard seeds and stuff like that. Their build is, they're adapted to biting very hard. Um, blue jay, love catching blue jays. And we caught so many of them, another resident species, but they also do migrate short distances because they track the acorn crops in fall. And in fact, on some of our Taconic Ridge lines, you'll see them streaming through in great numbers in the fall, which is it's amazing to see. But yeah, common resident bird, but just look at how stunning the plumage is. I mean, seriously, like that iridescent blue structural pigment stuff, it's just, it's mind boggling. And what I love about blue jays is they're very calm. And when we let them go, they just kind of sit and hang out with us for a little while. Like this bird could fly away, no problem, but just takes a little sit and then eventually it goes. Tufted titmouse, another resident species. Northern flicker, a stunning bird. They do move, um, but they, they can be found here year round. So early on the season, we're getting resident species. We're getting uh, birds that kind of start to migrate early, like golden crown kinglet, for example. There's a, that's the flicker's rump. We get great looks at all different parts of these birds, individual feathers and stuff like that. It's a real treat to be able to hold them. So. As we move along and spring starts to progress, the bird community shifts because we're documenting migration, birds that move. Here's a migrant bird that's very early. They overwinter mostly in the Southeast and they start to move north of the boreal forest very early in the season. It's a beautiful fox sparrow. So we got this, I think maybe we got this one April 6th. I think it was our second day. Exciting to get. Here's a hermit thrush also a bird that moves, they breed here, but they also breed much further north. I think this one was going further north. Ruby crown kinglet, which I showed you their range map earlier. They were starting to show up in sort of early to mid April, and then they really started to trickle in. Actually, I think they were our most abundant bird for the entire spring season. Um, they came through in great numbers early in the season, and it was cool to document that push. They sort of moved in pulses. Um, <clears throat> a lot of these migrant birds take advantage of south winds. Um, it's nice to have a tailwind, right, if you're traveling hundreds to thousands of miles. So we get a nice day with not too much rain or weather stuff and south winds, you get a big push of migrants. And we saw this so many times with Ruby Crown Kinglet. Red winged blackbird, that's another one that's early. They get here sort of like April-ish set up. Uh, territories, you start hearing them. The males come first as the males, you can tell because he's got that beautiful red patch on his wing. Louisiana water thrush. This is 
one of our very first warblers and very early migrant, early spring. And they're along these beautiful sort of like smaller brooks because they're, they are a stream, obligate sort of stream specialist. And this was Berkshire Bird Observatory's first ever warbler, which made me so happy because I have, I have a thing for Louisiana water thrush. White-throated sparrows, that's another bird that breeds mostly in the tundra, I think, even above the boreal forest. And so they come through pretty early. They're in the Southeast, okay. They're going to the boreal forest, they're coming through. Robins as well, resident, but moving north. Okay, now we're moving into spring a little bit into mid-April, starting to get blue-headed vireos. Those breed in the hemlock gorges here in Berkshire County. Woodcock doing their thing, displaying. Um, they are so weird. They're, they are like little aliens. Um, we can't ban them, unfortunately, because they're considered like game birds or whatever. They have their own bands, but we certainly took our time admiring this, this like alien baby bird thing. It's just super weird. Palm warbler, that's another warbler that's sort of overwinters in the Southeast Florida, the Caribbean. So they're not too far away. So they do come up in April. Black-throated blue warbler. Okay, things are starting to pick up. It's getting exciting. Myrtle warbler, that's the bird that I mentioned earlier breeds on the ridgetops in the South Taconics. So this is an adult male. Early in migration, the vanguard of migration is led by the adult males. Usually the older males come first and then they're followed by the younger males and the females. So we're documenting this sort of you know, migration that's structured by both sex and age classes. Rose-breasted grosbeak starting to come up. I, this, this one was great because I'm holding this bird and I'm taking my measurements, collecting my data. And then he just starts looking at the field guide. He's just looking like it's a mirror or something. He was checking that out. So I guess Sibley did a pretty good job with that illustration if he's convinced this rose-breasted grosbeak that that's something you know that he might want to pay attention to. Um, black and white warbler, stunning bird, also can be found in the southeast in winter. So they, they're one of the more early migrant warblers coming through. We're probably in late April by now. So things are starting to change. The ruby crown kinglets are starting to leave. We're not getting them anymore. We're getting more diversity. We're getting higher numbers of warblers. Common yellowthroat, that's also an early one, southeast overwinter bird. Chestnut sided warbler, adult male, absolutely beautiful. This crown on this bird, the puffy yellow thing and the chestnut flanks and it's just stunning, stunning bird, the face mask mustache thing. Happy to have them show up. Yellow warblers, now we're really getting diverse. Blue wing warbler, all adult males so far. Females are yet to come. Baltimore Oriole. Hummingbirds, right? Adult males again. Red start. Magnolia warbler. Prairie warbler. And then now the females are starting to show up. So we're in late April, we're in May even, and we have a female black-throated blue warbler on the left. On the top, a black and white warbler. On the bottom right there is a common yellow throat. And you'll notice that females look a little bit different. For the black-throated blue warbler on the left there, that warbler is not black-throated and it's not blue. It's maybe like cream-breasted greenish olive bluish warbler with white patch so it's funny like a lot of our names for birds are just for like adult males but most of the birds in the populations are not adults males they're females half of the population and younger birds so maybe 75 percent of the birds are like not adult males and yet we still call the birds by the adult male plumage which is kind of interesting maybe maybe we could change that a little bit i don't know but this black-throated blue warbler maybe not as contrasty and like, you know, on first glance as striking as the adult male black throated blue, but the subtle beauty of this bird is every bit as appealing to me as an adult male. The tail feathers are lines or etched with just a nice sort of bluish wash on the edges. You know, the, the sort of like creamy sort of tone of the breast kind of mixing and blending with these other sort of gentle pastel palettes. It's just, it's really pretty. And as banders, we get to look at these birds up close and admire every feather. So of course, we love the female birds every bit as much as the males. Speaking of, here's a cool female bird. This is a pileated woodpecker. And when I pulled this thing out of the net, I was kind of like, I, yeah, I didn't really know what to do. This is a huge bird. This is, a, as you can see, it's bigger than my hand and very hard, hard to hold. 
So yeah, it was really exciting to see it though. When I, when I saw the net, I, I actually heard the call first and then I saw the pull of the mist that shake and I ran out there and then I see the pileated woodpecker in the bottom pocket. And I'm like, oh my gosh, this is a wonderful day. But they are absolutely a handful. So I kind of had to use my body to, you know, tuck the bird in so it couldn't like flap or whatever and then take my measurements, ban the bird and then let the bird go. And the cool thing about woodpeckers, sometimes they'll do this on release. Bye bye. <laughs> I love that. So I like for woodpeckers, I like to give them the option. You can fly or you can do the climb, the climby thing that you like to do. And that one gave us a show and just climbed right up the trunk. So another cool release this is a ruby throated hummingbird. And um, my brother actually captured this video in slow-mo. You have to see this. Hummingbirds are amazing. Just the the 180 twist and just up, just straight up to the heavens is awesome. So yes, things pick up in migration. When you get into May and you have, that's the peak. That's when most of the birds are moving. Birds coming from Central and South America even. Um, let's see, will this play? This is a forecast of migration. This shows movements of birds in the air. This is from Cornell. Um, and you'll see on the lower left there, it gives you an estimate of birds in the air in millions in flight for an evening in May. What is this? May 15th. This is peak. So I just want to play this. This is what I look at in the early morning to know the kind of volume that we're going to confront at the banding station later on in the morning. So let's see. Get this play. Night. And then everything takes off because these are nocturnal migrants. 210, 268, 300 million. So that's, that's migration in the peak, you know, hundreds of millions of birds flying over your heads while you sleep at night and then coming down and stopping over and needing to refuel to get insects to power and fuel this migration flight up to where they breathe. Many of them breed here. Many of them, most of them are going up to the boreal forest of Canada. Um, so yes, so our mountains here, our forests in the Berkshires are not only just a refuge for breeding birds, but they're absolutely crucial to power this migration for birds that are ultimately breeding north of us. So I just wanna stress that. And we're monitoring that, our data we're collecting, we're showing this, we're documenting the timing of migration, how many birds are moving of which species and all this. And we're collecting much more data that you can only get by having birds in the hand. So, um, and of course, all of our data goes up to the federal government and can be used for wide scale analyses with data pooled from multiple banding stations, as well as we can answer our own questions about what's going on locally here. But migration is a spectacle, it's a miracle, and it's a true privilege to be able to run a banding station and to witness it as it happens in real time. Um, so let's see. So now we're getting into the sort of the peak and the tail end of migration. We're getting birds that are just coming from straight up South America flying thousands of miles to be here. This is an indigo bunting adult male that looks like a blue fire comet. Like unbelievable plumage on this. Black burning and warbler. This was our first one of them. This is a female, really stunning, nice sort of like egg yolk sort of throat thing going. This bird, you know, we were confused about actually at first when we got it because I have never seen, I don't think, a female bay-breasted warbler before. And when I looked at this, the, the field guide doesn't even document this bird all that well, at least Sibley. It looked almost like a black pole warbler by the back streaking. We knew it was bay-breasted, at least somewhat from the sort of uh, reddish wash on the flanks. But I was just like, oh my God, what is this? Like Sibley doesn't even document this kind of thing. Cause you don't see these birds, they're in the canopy. And if it's not a singing male, like you're almost never gonna see it. But when you miss net, you're sampling these cryptic, elusive species. You're catching them, you're documenting them. So it's a really awesome method that gets us, you know, great looks of birds that you wouldn't otherwise detect. And it's great for our data set too. Um, this year, we got an influx of Philadelphia uh, vireos in the spring, and that's a rare bird. That is not supposed to pass through our region in the spring, according to historical data, field guides and all of that. So we caught, I think, four of them this spring, and that's really cool. So we're documenting rarities, uh, vagrancies, and stuff like that 
it happens. And when, since we're out there every single day, we can we can get this in our data set. Uh, Canada warbler, stunning bird, scarlet tanagers also coming from South America. There's the male and female there. We caught them together, which is really special. Barn swallow, another very long distance migrant. Black-billed cuckoo, one of my favorite birds ever. They have the woodpecker feet, which I love because I, I did a lot of research on woodpeckers and like seeing that in a non-woodpecker bird. Wow, it's cool. Super long tail, elegant proportions, understated colors, very fascinating life history, and they eat spongy moth. Like you can't really beat the black-billed cuckoo. Okay, you can go. Bye bye. <laughs> okay, yes, the black billed cuckoo has inspired the logo for Berkshire Bird Observatory. So I that's birds, that's pretty birds and stuff like that. So when we're when we have birds in the hand, we take a closer look at them because we can get a lot of data that you get from birds in the hand that you wouldn't otherwise get by looking at the feathers. For example, this is an indigo bunting, and its feathers show multiple generations, feathers that were grown at different times. And by looking at the contrast in these different feathers, we can determine the age of the bird. So this bird we know is what we would call a second year bird, which means it wasn't born last summer, or it, I'm sorry, it was born last summer. So we can tell that because we see these bluish feathers intermixed with brownish edge feathers. And we can see like sort of the outer flight feathers, the outer feathers on the wing are very dull, sort of brownish black, very faded and worn and they contrast with the newer fresher replaced inner feathers so this bird's plumage tells us that yeah you were born last summer so that's great so when you ban birds not only do you document numbers numbers of species the timing of migration but you can also look at age structure of populations because you can determine age for a lot of these birds so we're, we're getting really great data that you know just counting birds or whatever trying to listen to them you wouldn't get for example, this is an adult indigo bunting. And if you look at the wing there, it's all uniform black and blue, um, looks very different. All these feathers are fresh. They're very adult, looks very different than this. So we have a young male, we have an adult male, and we can tell that because we have the birds in the hand. Here's a rose-breasted grosbeak, adult male. You get a look at those beautiful pinkish roses, rose-colored underwing coverts, that's nice. Here's a female rose breast to grow speak, and it's a totally different plumage and a different look. So plumage characteristics, breeding characteristics, molt patterns, patterns of wear, these kinds of things are things that banders with keen eyes can pick up on to determine age, sex of these different species. So we're doing that. All right, so that's, that's banding. That was our first spring season. It was an incredible season. We caught over 1,500 birds. Um, over a thousand newly banded birds with like 500 or so recaptures and i think we did a our biggest day was 82 birds in a single day 72 species i think 25 warbler species so i know jug end is an exceptional place to do this migration research but we're doing other stuff too so kestrels let's talk about kestrels kestrels are a little pocket falcon and they are birds of the open country. So they're in sort of like the farmland, the fields, the valleys of Berkshire County and many other places. And they're absolutely stunning birds. Their flight is acrobatic. Unfortunately, they've declined. They've declined 70 to 80% in New England in the last 60 years. So that is a precipitous decline. We want to help kestrels. So we're putting out nest boxes for these birds. They nest naturally in cavities and big dead trees. Well, that's a limiting resource. There aren't a lot of big dead trees with big, nice cavities in them. So we're putting out boxes across Berkshire County in collaboration with our partner. Uh, our partners like BNRC is helping us with this, for example. Many private landowners are helping with this on farms, organic farms, that kind of thing. But we wanna get boxes out for these birds to have nesting structures to be able to raise young. Um, and this work was sort of inspired by Art Ginger here, who's down in Connecticut. He did this big kestrel box project down in Northwest Connecticut and basically, you know, brought kestrels back to the Western part of the state of Connecticut, um, almost single-handedly. So I met Art, that's Rennie, by the way, Rennie Wendell on, on the right there, who's TNC. Um, we met Art um, in Sheffield and we banded some kestrels. 
Art is a show person at the highest level. <laughs> he gets his big ladder up. He goes up to the box. He brings the babies down. Everyone loves a bucket full of baby birds. He shows us how to age them based on their feather growth. He shows us how to hold them firmly, but carefully. And he passes the kestrels around for everyone. And there's me. I even got two kestrels in my hand. Thanks, Art. So Art's work really inspired me. And it got me thinking like, okay, Art has brought kestrels back to Connecticut. Connecticut, Western Connecticut is just south of us. What if we get boxes out in our landscape? I know we have the habitat. If we get the boxes, we can get the birds. We can bring them back in numbers to Berkshire County. So that's what I want to do. And, you know, I think it was meant to happen because at our songbird banding station, I caught a kestrel and we never catch kestrels. I've never caught a kestrel before. This is an adult male that I caught. And guess what? It came from Southern Connecticut. How do I know that? Because it was already banded. It was banded by Art Ginger two years ago. And it flew up to where I banned birds at Jug End and it went into my mist net. And if that's not a sign that I should be doing kestrel work to support these birds, if that's not a sign that Art's work in Connecticut is overflowing across the state boundaries, then I don't know. And by the way, when you get this foreign recovery, when you catch birds, someone else banded, it's extremely rare. You get an actual like certificate from the federal bird banding lab and they tell you where it was banded, when it was banded, who banded it. And they say, thanks, you're doing great work, keep it up. So that was really cool. Yes, so we're doing kestrel stuff. We're part of the American Kestrel Partnership. This organization is part of the Peregrine Fund, which is a big nonprofit. They wanna help kestrels. So if you join the partnership, you contribute data to this big international organization collaboration, and they do continent-wide analysis of the data so they can understand on a very big scale what's impacting kestrels and what we can do to help them. So not only are we getting local data from monitoring nest boxes, I didn't even mention we're doing that, from monitoring the nest box, seeing how the birds do, we're also contributing to a bigger project that's understanding stuff on a much bigger scale. So there we are, we're part of the American Kestrel Partnership and we hope to get more boxes out to continue to help these birds. Here's where our current boxes are. And they're only there because of our partners. Towns like Great Barrington and Tiringham have been supportive. Private landowners on Baldwin Hill and other places. Um, organic farms like Indian Line Farm, um, Tap Farms have all helped. They want to support the birds. We want to continue to get the boxes out and continue to help these birds in the county. Here's my truck, uh, field truck, a mini. And that's John Tower, who has been instrumental in putting these boxes out. Uh, he works for the trustees and he's, he and I have really done a lot of the work to get these boxes in the ground. So John Tower is a huge part of this. And I hope the trustees people continue to support him. They've helped us. They're going to help us get some boxes up on their land. Uh, John is a real asset for them. Uh, he knows a lot about bird boxes and how to get birds in boxes. Yes, there's the Kestrel boxes. Uh, these are from Mass Wildlife from Drew Vitz, made by Carl Nelson, who is an expert in making these boxes. They're beautiful. So I'm grateful to Drew for giving us Carl's boxes. I'm grateful to Carl for making the boxes. We're going to put them to use. Most of them are already out on the landscape. That's our first one we put up. That's at Taft Farms. That one is at the Schumacher Center. That's Susan Witt, and she's overseeing our sort of measurements, make sure everything's good. This one's at McAllister Park in Great Barrington. We're happy to get one there and grateful to the town for allowing us to put it up. Uh, here's Indian Line Farm. That's John doing his thing. Here's a nice bouquet I picked because I get my CSA from Indian Line and Elizabeth Keene graciously is hosting one of our Kestrel boxes there. And we hope a Kestrel pair will grace her with their presence. It's a good addition to your organic farm. This is the Becker family. This is sort of like Baldwin Hill, got a box up there. And we had a lot of help. It's nice when the community can sort of come together to support something that's really good for wildlife and good for people and good for everything. So the Kestrel project, I think is a really important thing. So we get the boxes on the ground that we monitor them. We wanna know, do they, is there a pair using it? Do they have eggs? How many eggs? Later on in the season, we want to check these boxes. Oh, whoa, oh, it's a daddy kestrel. And he's sitting on the eggs because male kestrels will incubate their eggs. And they just sit there when you open the box. It's pretty amazing. Here's another one. I mean, daddy kestrel in the box is pretty special. Oh, that's the daddy. <laughs> That's the daddy kestrel. Okay, sorry. So this is a jug end. This is, this is where, where we are for a lot of our work. 
And this is a mass wildlife box. They have already had this one there. We've got the little babies in there. They're just, they're just so cute. <laughs> so yes. So once the kestrels get to an old enough age, we want to ban them. We want to collect some data and we're checking the boxes to see if they're successful. And then later we'll do analyses based on data that we collect on the surrounding landscape to try to relate how successful the boxes were to features in the landscape, that kind of thing. So it's a scientific project, but it's also a way to directly help wildlife by giving them a place to nest. So I, I love it. It's special. This is Carla Turner, Turner Farms, and she came out to check out the little babies and help me help me ban them. Here's a female kestrel. She's got all this nice barring. Uh, this is probably day like 22 or so. Uh, this is a male. He's got the blue in the wing and the nice big black band on the tail. So they look a little bit different. And this one is the runt, the runt of the, of the litter. Um, kestrels will start in incubating on their pen ultimate egg. So the last egg doesn't quite get incubated as long or it takes longer to hatch, I guess is the way to put it. So you always have like sort of like a runt baby that's not as developed and it's usually the cutest one. All right, so now all of our boxes are used by kestrels. We hope that ultimately they will be, but this one had bluebird eggs, okay? We're happy to support bluebirds. This one had tree swallow babies. Okay, that looks really cozy and we're happy to support tree swallows too. So it's gonna take time for the kestrel population to increase and it's gonna take time for these boxes to all become occupied. We hope they will eventually, but in the meantime, they're providing excellent habitat for all their native species. So that makes us happy. Okay, um, how am I doing on time, Charlotte? I think I'm going over a bit. Um, yeah, let's say maybe five more minutes at most before questions. Okay, yes, I'm sorry I'm going over. So I will be very quick. So we're also doing banding in the summer as a collaboration with the Institute for Bird Populations, which I worked for. I did one of my first internships with them. It's a big nonprofit focused on helping birds. Uh, we have a banding station that's separate for this. And what we do as part of this project, it's during the summer, we wanna know how productive our birds are that are using our forest here in the Southern Taconic. So we catch babies on the left, that's a baby Baltimore Oriole and that's his daddy. And we catch adults. And from that ratio of babies to adults and some other information, we can determine how well the birds did in terms of like breeding success, productivity. And also by catching birds, marking them and recapturing them, we can get estimates of how well they survive. So this project is called MAPS, Monitoring Avian Productivity and Survivorship. And it's gonna give us great data on how well the birds are doing in our region here, South Conics. But that data is also contributed to IBP to get a big sense of how birds are doing across North America. So this is our sort of sample area. It's pretty big. Our banding station is small, but it's pulling birds from the surrounding landscape. So we're actually sampling birds that disperse from eight or nine uh, taconic peaks that those birds, adults and juveniles post-breeding will come into areas with successional habitat like the Jug End Valley and we'll catch them there when they move. And then we're getting data on, on basically how productive the Northern end of the Southern Taconics are in terms of supporting breeding birds. So it's, it's additional data to our point count surveys. It tells us actually a lot more um, so those two things work together. It gives different information. It's better, uh, sort of a more holistic picture of how the birds are doing in our region. So I wanted to show you birds, baby birds. Uh, they're speckly, they're cryptic, they're cute, but we don't have a ton of time. So I just will blow through all these babies. I, I will show you this one though, this wood thrush with the, with the gape that's all bright, you know, bright orange pink. That's, that is a bird that is begging for us banders to feed. That bird wants us to feed him because they, they think that you're their mommy sometimes because they're silly babies. And so it's just so endearing. And I, I did want to show this though. This is uh, Caroline Pierce. She brings us snacks when we band and she makes the most wonderful food. She's a recipe designer. So we love helpers at the banding station and helpers that help in different ways. And I have to say that Caroline is awesome. Okay, we're also doing fall migration. Just very quickly, these are the two people that I've hired for to help us band in fall, and these are exceptional people. So if anyone comes by the banding station, they will see our exceptional helpers. Uh, this is Rowan on the left and Anna on the right, and they're both really phenomenal people. And I'm so excited to have highly skilled staff help us. We've already caught crazy birds. We've caught rare Southern warblers already this fall that aren't supposed to be here, but because of climate change and that kind of thing, which we're documenting with our banding data, we're catching rare birds that typically are further south of us. So there's two of them already caught in our first three days of fall banding. 
other fall birds. We already kind of built a kingfisher in the stream. At, okay, we're happy about that. Some multi stuff that we're documenting. We're going to band owls this fall too. Solid owls, part of another big collaboration we're doing. They're amazing. All right, so to wrap this up, I got a little grant from UVM, which I'm grateful for to support our banders. But of course, for Berkshire Bird Observatory to be a long-term thing, we will need volunteers that are dedicated to help us out. We will need organizations like BNRC to help host kestrel boxes, private landowners to host, host kestrel boxes. And of course, donations. Eventually, we're going to need that. So I just want to say, if anyone can help and wants to help, then they can contact me because we need help in many different ways. So it's ben at berkshirebirds.org. And with that, I will say thank you. Thank you very much for hosting this BNRC. Sorry I went over my time. Mass Wildlife, thank you so much for allowing us to do the work at Jug End. UVM for the grant, all the other nonprofit organizations that have been supportive and all these individuals and probably some that I have forgot. Thank you very much. And thanks for your time and for listening to this presentation. Awesome, thank you, Ben. That was a wealth of information. I'm sure we're all jazzed about getting outside and um, learning more. We do have a few questions that came in the chat. Um, I would like to invite folks, if you wanna virtually raise your hand using the reactions at the bottom of your screen, feel free to do that. And you can unmute and ask your own question. Um, but we'll start first with Anthony's question. Um, which was, do you think climate change will have an effect on the phenology of birds, flora, and insects and alter the types of birds that we will see in the Berkshires and elsewhere? You touched on this a little bit already, but have you already observed changes? Right there. Yes. <laughs> and so the thing with phenological changes and that kind of stuff, yes, climate change is happening. It's real. It's happening now in real time. We're seeing the effects. But to document those effects, you need long-term data sets. So what we're doing is considered long-term monitoring. And it's crucial for, for being able to see how things change. You can't just be banning birds for one year or two years. You need to be out there for multiple years. And the more years you're doing this, collecting this kind of data, the more robust the data set is and the, the better you're going to be able to see patterns, patterns in the data and model trends. So yes, it's absolutely happening. We're already seeing it with these two birds that we caught like in the past couple of days. So, wonderful question. All right, um, I'm gonna go on to the next question. Let's see, um, this one came at the very beginning. Uh, I see very few robins around the summer. Any explanation? Yeah, I don't know. I don't have an explanation for that. Um, yeah, I haven't noticed, maybe it's just like a local kind of thing, like maybe in your local sort of area, they weren't there because there weren't as many worms for them to get at or something. I can't, I can't say that I know why that is, but you know, that's good to document. If you pay attention, you can find out some little local patterns for yourself if you keep good records, so. Thank you. Um, so the next question is from Joseph. Is there any danger to the birds from handling them with bare hands? Is ster sterility or lack of it a problem for them? No, and actually using like gloves or something would be, would be a problem. You need your hands to be like, you know, hands. Um, we, for, for us as banders, we subscribe to the Banders Code of Ethics, which stipulates that the safety and welfare of every individual bird is always put first. We care very much about the birds. We have skilled hands. We're very careful. Um, we have caring and skilled hands and we handle the birds with the utmost care. Um, there is no risk of them getting some kind of like germs or something from our human hands at, at all. So no, they're fine. Uh, one, one thing that can happen though is if you have a bird with some kind of symptoms of a disease like avian pox or something like that, you can get cross-contamination. Um, if you're handling a bird that has a bird disease, and then you know you handle another bird, there is a small chance of transmitting that. But whenever we see a bird that seems like it's a little bit sick, we always use hand sanitizer before we touch another bird. So yeah, that's not really a concern. All right, thank you. The next question is from Mitchell and uh, he asks, are there any species that had surprisingly low numbers at the station this spring? Any thoughts as to why? That's a great question. I, I would say no, because I didn't know what to expect because for the banding, this was our pilot season. It was the very first season. So I had nothing to compare our numbers to. So I didn't, I didn't really know what to expect. I, I will just say that I was surprised, pleasantly surprised 
with the volume and diversity of birds that we got at the station. Um, but in terms of like, oh, this is a low year for ruby crown kinglets, or oh, it seems like there's a trend here with, you know, a change in phenology. That's kind of information that you get after you've banded for three, four, and more years. But that's a great question. Great. They're just coming in. So this is from um, an unknown person. It says, can I put up bird boxes near my house? And if so, what kind? I live on top of a mountain in Sandusfield. Yeah, so if you're on top of a mountain, it, well, it all depends on like sort of the vegetation around you. If you have open sort of habitat, like a big sort of grassy, meadowy, or even lawn-like area, then bluebird boxes could work. You know, for tree swallows and bluebird boxes, they need open space. Um, if you're just surrounded by forest, if it's like a forested peak, then you could put out some smaller boxes for like chickadees. They would, they would use those. Kestrel boxes need to be in very specific places with lots of perches and lots of open land. So maybe not a kestrel box. It, I wouldn't see them being up there. But yeah, you could definitely try like chickadee box, bluebird box. Thank you. So from Sean. I live in Chicago, but I am from Massachusetts. Is there any way to get involved remotely? Remotely? Um, well, you you listen to our talk. Um, yeah, I don't know. I don't know. I don't have to think about that. I mean, yeah, I mean, so Sean, maybe there's a banding station. I mean, if you're in Chicago, there are people that band birds and do bird research, certainly. So maybe a better option for you would be to reach out, you know, do Google search for like bird observatory or avian research center in more local to you. Um, because banding stations, bird observatories are always looking for interested, passionate people who care about birds to help them with their work. So I would start that. And if you're in Massachusetts, you can email me, I might email now. Thank you. Um, so we have a few questions that Charlotte and I put together, but I'd like to open it up to other participants if you have any in the last 10 minutes we have here. In the meantime, I'll pose my question. Um, I'm a very novice birder, so this might be a silly question, but do ticks impact birds at all? Well, we certainly see ticks on birds. And in fact, on this hooded warbler on the left there, right above and below the eye, there's those little dots, those are ticks. But warblers are shrub nesting species and they're usually low in the shrubby stuff. And there's lots of ticks, you know, and so they pick them up. We see ticks on a lot of birds. As far as do they get tick-borne illnesses? I don't know. So, I mean, someone knows that, I don't know that. Um, do, do, do the ticks because they take blood, you know, they're, they're ectoparasites, they must take some kind of a toll. Is it enough to like have an impact that, you know, is measurable or ecologically significant? I don't know. That's a great question. I, I mean, we certainly see these parasites on, on the birds. So I, they do, they must have an impact, but I don't know what, you know, at what level. Related to that, do birds, can they significantly decrease the population of ticks by consuming them? That's another great question that I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> uh, I've heard, and this is just like, uh, you know, whatever, just something I've heard. What do you call that? Um, um, that bobwhite quail eat a lot of ticks or something like that. And maybe some other birds eat ticks. I, I don't know. I wouldn't eat a tick. Like they, they seem to be very hard. Uh, they have a very hard exoskeleton and not a whole lot of meat. Like a lot of these birds, like these warblers here, for example, they eat like juicy, like cat moth caterpillars, lepidopterans and stuff like that. I don't think they'd go for ticks, but I don't know. So that's something that you'd have to go spend a lot of time looking at birds that live in ticky areas with your binoculars glued to them to see if they're picking ticks off plants. Uh, or maybe there's new diet studies that where you can use high throughput sequencing of fecal samples to see diet in birds and other animals. So Maybe that's a question for like the cutting edge, you know, labs that do bird stuff at the universities and stuff. Yeah. Very interesting. Um, I have another question. How can we manage our forests to better serve birds, if that's at all within your expertise? 
Yeah. I mean, I am, I, I don't know. I'm an ecologist and stuff like that. And I've worked in a lot of different forested landscapes and I know a little bit about bird distribution and the, what bird, different birds like. And I'll just say that some birds like some kinds of habitat and other birds like other kinds of habitat. And that's why birds are great indicator species. Cause for example, if I'm in a forest and I start hearing hooded warblers singing, I know that there's some small forest clearings or some sort of riparian edges where there's lots of shrubs and low vegetation, right? Because hooded warblers like scrubby sort of successional growth. On the right here, we have a worm-eating warbler and they don't really care about that because um, they don't nest in shrubs and they like really mature core forest in the middle of a big mature forest without a whole lot of disturbance usually with steep slopes and that kind of thing. So these two birds right on the screen have very different habitat preferences. And Hooded Warbler would say, cut more gaps in the canopy. I want shrubby stuff. And Worm Eating Warbler would say, no, I want, I want the forest totally intact and completely closed and big, huge continuous forest thing. So you, you, what are your management objectives? Like, what are you trying to achieve? That is, you, you have to have that in the back of your mind. I will just say on a broader scale, Forests are very important for a lot of these neotropical birds, big forests. So just speaking very generally, I would say, yeah, I think it's good to promote sort of like, you know, forest conservation broadly. And I don't mean plantation forests. I mean, natural sort of forests that aren't being crazy harvested all the time, that aren't monocultures. I'm talking about diverse sort of natural systems. Uh, I, I would be for that. But of course, we need to manage for successional species. Grassland species have declined a lot um, in North America, really a lot. So grasslands are important too. Organic farms and that kind of stuff are important. Kestrels need that. They don't like forests really. So you got to be thinking about all of that and what your management objectives are and like scale and all of that. Yeah, it's, it's com it, that's a complex thing. Thank you. Um, we had some some nice cheers in the chat um, from Julie. Yes, keep forests as forests. <laughs> um, so Aaron had a couple questions. Um, what kinds of things do volunteers at Berkshire Bird Observatory do? And what kind of time commitment are you looking for? Yeah, so we right now, you know, we're in our pilot year with the banding anyway. And we've had some really wonderful people come visit, you know, visit and see if maybe that's something they'd like to do more frequently. Um, yeah, for, for me, uh, the ideal sort of like volunteer would be someone that loves birds, obviously, like really loves them and cares about them deeply, and who is willing to get up really early and could commit to being fairly consistent as a volunteer, you know, like over time. And that doesn't mean come out and help us every single day during migration. People have jobs and stuff like that. We're crazy people, so we work every day. But that would mean more like, okay, I'm gonna come like Tuesday every week for, or, you know, that kind of thing. Because for volunteers at a banding station, how it works is you start out maybe recording data on a data sheet or, you know, more simple sort of tasks. And if you're dedicating, you come and you're consistent, then I can work to train you and teach you skills that take a long time to acquire. But for me to invest in a volunteer and teach them how to take birds out of nets, for example, that's not an easy thing. That's not something that's like, you learn that really quick. That's years of training. Um, so if I want people that I want to invest in, I want to know that they care about birds and their well-being, essential, and that they're going to be committed, that they're going to be around longer. Because if you just volunteer a couple of times, you're not helping, actually. You're taking my time and resources, which I'm, I'm very happy to give. I, I love doing demonstration. I love when people just visit because they're interested. But if you want to be a volunteer and you want to get the training, because you're going to get great training at BBO, then I, I want commitment. Yeah, you know, consistency. Like, Thank you. Um, so I think we have time for this last question, also by Aaron. Of, have, have you played the board game Wingspan? Yeah, I have. Yeah, I played it. I played it like once, I think. And it's it's really pretty, the illustrate or the paintings, whatever, they're really pretty. Um, but I it's not like yeah, it's not like a game that I really know all that well. I wonder if they like this game or why they ask. <laughs> Aaron, feel free to unmute if you have a comment you want to share. <laughs> I 
I think it's a great game. Like Ben said, it's beautifully illustrated. So if anyone's into board games, I highly recommend it. Uh, you can also play it online on Steam. Awesome. <laughs> it's great to know. Nice. Add it to the list. Um, good deal. Um, so I believe our time is wrapped up. Um, ben, if you could unshare your screen, I have a quick slide I was going to put up. Thank you. Let's see. There we go. So I just want to um, thank everyone for joining us this afternoon and especially Ben for sharing the fantastic background about your journey and what brought you to this um, passion and the research you're doing. Um, I feel like it's really going to help encourage us all to keep learning. Um, Charlotte, would you like to say some closing words? I, I just want to say that was it was really wonderful and engaging for, um, presentation, and I can't wait to join you for bird banding this weekend. <laughs> Good deal. Well, um, we will be following up. Um, this was recorded, and we'll send that along, um, along with maybe Ben's contact email, if that's okay, um, and other information that was shared during the program. But um, hope everyone has a good rest of their week, and we'll see you next time. Thanks, everyone. It was fun. Thanks, Ryan, Charlotte. Bye. Lots of nice chats. <laughs> <laughs>